You're listening to Chrysalis Colored, the podcast. Hello, this is Jorun from Norway and Christine in Canada with a podcast about color analysis and how it applies to you in a practical way. We'll talk about how to use your colors to make your days brighter, your wardrobe more enjoyable, and your life easier. We'll talk about topics that we find interesting, and we encourage you to submit your questions. A podcast listing is available at chrysaliscolor.com under the podcasts tab. In this episode, episode 24, Christine and I are going to share our favorite makeup hacks with you. So get your notebooks out and get ready. We have both worn makeup for a long time. I started in my teens and you're in as well. Yep, I did. I had, I remember I had a bright blue eyeshadow. And it's funny, I haven't thought about that for a long time, but it was, it was a, it, it would slide right in now with my bright winter makeup. It's funny, huh? But I probably bought it because that was all the rage, not because I knew anything. But did I, you wear I, anything else with it? Was it just the eyeshadow? Because that's what I did. So I had, I had, <laughs> I had um, what did I have? I think I had probably just that eyeshadow and some mascara right I, I honestly can't remember yeah I... <laughs> but uh, Christine you yeah. told me <laughs> about something called the world of beauty club yes it, it was something like the world of beauty clubs club so we're in the mid-1970s I am 14 or 15 mm -hmm. not quite in mm -hmm. high school yet and <laughs> My parents didn't really enjoy the fact that I wanted to wear makeup, a streak of purple eyeshadow only to school. So <laughs> <laughs> defiant, I would leave the house with no makeup on. And then in the driveway, in the reflection, my reflection in the windows, the car windows, I would put on my streak of purple eyeshadow. And then I'd look up at the kitchen window with my mother's face <laughs> and I would walk off to school. And uh, I used to get Seventeen magazine, I think it was in Seventeen, and there was an ad at the back for World of Beauty Club. And it was just too good to be true for $9.99 a month. This <laughs> box of makeup, nice makeup, Mary Quant and all sorts of it would be delivered right to your front door. So I signed up. <laughs> now, my mother was a... <laughs> Um, European. She was Hungarian. She didn't learn to speak English until she came to Canada and was working here in the mid-1950s. And uh, so this box of makeup started to appear. Well, I was 15. I had no income. And my mother, not steeped in North American tradition. And, and back then, you know, people, the neighbors were watching and you did what, what was right. And so my mother would pay for this. <laughs> and I had <laughs> There's a mounting stack of makeup boxes because they come every month. And then eventually I had more makeup than even I could possibly wear. I had no idea what to do with it. And I tried to stop the subscription, but no surprise to listeners. Of course, it didn't stop. They kept coming. <laughs> and my mother could not bring herself to refuse to pay because one didn't do that. And she wouldn't have known how to, how to do that. And so I don't know how it finally ended, but I had a makeup stash, you wouldn't believe, by the time that was over at the, at the young age of 15. But I've worn it ever since. I've, I uh, liked magazines and I discovered the power of foundation early in life. And, you know, then you discover your hair and then you discover what your eyelashes can do. And, and well, at that point, you're on a, path of no return ah yes you know we had we could even get 17 in uh, Norway yeah it was very exotic we would uh -huh. like snatch it up wherever we could and yes. read about Donny Osmond yes and, the <laughs> yeah. and I would see ads for Mary Quant but of course there was nothing nothing like that in Norway at that time oh. but I would kind of lust after those yes uh, yeah makeups and the magazine was in English? Yes, yes, but we had English in school. So we were, re that's, that was kind of how yeah. I learned English was from the lyrics of Elton John songs. Right, and, 
yeah. read 17 magazine. Mm. Well, good incentive, right? To learn a language that always impresses me about Europeans. I've had students here. One came from Romania, I believe, and she spoke really good English. I asked her how she said, well, she would watch American movies. I promise you that I could not learn Norwegian or Romanian <laughs> by watching movies from those countries. So I've, I've always found that very impressive. Yeah, I think it's about necessity. When you live in a country that has less inhabitants than an average American city, you kind of have to learn another language in order to get around, you know, internationally. Yeah, yeah that's probably true. Or it's just normal. I, I grew up in Quebec and it was just normal, you know, so you don't think it's odd until you go somewhere where it's different. Anyhow, that's my, my early well, days of makeup. Yes, and we grew up and we had years and years of practice, cancelled our subscriptions. <laughs> or tried, yeah. Okay, you must have, otherwise you'd be covered in boxes by now, right, Christine? Yes, yep. Well, anyway, on to the makeup hacks. And uh, how about I go first? Great. And one of my recent discoveries was this, how to avoid or um, alleviate resting bitch face <laughs> anyway and and you know, as you know I do I love Lisa Eldridge and even though she uses like 15 different brushes and like 20 different concealer foundation before she even goes out I, I really like her um, her videos because I like her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so her, her the most recent one that I was obsessed with was this: how to put on lipstick without getting this this kind of up downturned mouth because mm -hmm. I don't know gravity, you know, kind mm -hmm. of pulls everything down in my in the corners of my lips, mm -hmm. and I I probably have a terrible resting bitch face because. I get asked when I'm kind of pensive and thinking, and then people say, are you mad? Are you angry? <laughs> no, I'm not angry. I'm just thinking. Mm. Anyway, so then my, um, my attention was instantly piqued when I saw that she had this video. And the trick is to not, well, of course, she has, like I said, 15 different brushes and, and concealer at the corner of her uh, mouth. But I think the main takeaway that I took was to not pull the lipstick way out in the corners of my mouth to kind of stop it before it reaches that corner and then also I do put concealer a little bit more in towards my the corners of my mouth and it really does make a little bit of a difference. Mm -hmm. I watched that and I wondered if do you find that when you take the concealer closer to the corners of the mouth that it gets cakey in the corners? No, because I don't use concealer. <laughs> I, oh yeah. <laughs> so no, no, that is not a problem, Christine. Right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, no, um, actually I have a foundation that's really good um, mm -hmm. and it doesn't, it doesn't cake. So I just dab a little bit of the concealer closer to the corners of my oh. lip. Mm -hmm. I watched that video and and Lisa seemed to bring the concealer closer into the corners of the mouth to kind of cover the, the downward turn. And um, yeah, I wondered if the concealer is going to cake because it's the other thing that can happen is I like you, I don't use concealer because I just don't take the time, but I sure do recognize the, the how wonderful it is. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I find is that part of the reason we look angry because I'm 60 years old now is that I have, there are certain frown lines between the eyebrows that are, they're not going to go anywhere. And that we also lose volume. We lose fat under the skin in the chin area. So yeah. the corners of the mouth come down a little bit and there's a few more hollows. And I find that rather than putting concealer close to the corners of the mouth, the way that Lisa did, I'll often put an upward slanted line May, uh, uh, underneath the outer corners of the lower lip, let's say maybe an inch long line, and I blend that upwards. So it's yeah. the same sort of idea. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that's yeah. a good idea. And do you do this routinely? You bring the you shorten up the lipstick area, and then you yes. bring the foundation a little closer to the corners of the mouth. But you don't find that the foundation gets cakey or anything. 
No, it doesn't. And and it's just the main point is that I don't drag the lipstick yeah. out of the corners of my mouth. Right. And so that that's more important, I think, than to, to do the... Um, and you use um, lip liner. You're very good at using lip liner pencil. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe you would... How would you do that if you do lip liner? Probably the same thing. I have, I use a L'Oreal infallible pencil. It was a color that I came upon that uh, really did match my lips. It was called Rose and it really did stay in place very well. And I have one part of my lower lip that is, has a little bit of a deeper crack. So it's kind of like at the sides of the mouth, lipstick would migrate into that. And so I have a well, years ago when I lived in Ontario and, and uh, it was probably a little more affordable, I had a thread of filler injected along the edge of the lips and it really opened up that area. But you do become aware of lipstick migrating into these spots and the lip liner is st fabulous. Of course, it was discontinued, but I found it somewhere uh, and I, I ordered 30 of them. Yeah. <laughs> Our yeah. 25, I'm sure they saw that order come in and they saw... Okay, 25. And then they're putting it in the box, right? 19, 20, 21, <laughs> 22, 76, 77, <laughs> filling the box. But I have a supply of that lip liner. It's precious. Hmm. So yes, workarounds. Yeah. Sounds like a very good lip liner if you yeah. took it cleaned out there. Yeah, there. They, they were they had they were out after that. But you know, another thing that comes to my mind about concealer is I, I like to watch um, makeup videos too. I find it kind of hypnotic. And you often see a recommendation for a concealer to be put in a V shape under the eyes. So from the outer corner down to say the top of the cheekbone to the inner corner. And to some extent, I see the value of that in the sense that not for everybody, but for many people, particularly when color is too cool, too dark or both, that's exactly where you're going to see a shadow. Maybe like you remember seeing pictures of clowns with makeup on where they drag a line kind of down in a V under the eye and then they pull it down a little further on the cheek and it gives a very sad look to the face. And so sure, you, you well, first of all, don't wear colors that are too cool and too dark, but that aside, um, you can put the concealer on like that. The problem for me is, once again, at my age, I'm putting an area under my eye of concealer. The stuff is cakey. It would, I'd have to pull on the skin. You got to get the color really close with concealer because of the density of the product. And I don't, I'm not convinced this is a very flattering look, unless you happen to have quite oily skin or you know, you're know you a younger person with tighter skin, but I'm not convinced about that one. What I think works better is use foundation to make the color under the eyes about the same as the rest of the face and put your concealer at the inner corner and the outer corners of the eyes because it brings light to the area without using frost. Uh, you often see them using a little bit of frost at the inner and the outer corner. Well, you know, that's lovely if you're 30, but I'm not sure if someone I knew my age, 40 and above, wore that to a meeting at nine o'clock in the morning, I, I would find it a little odd to see it frost. But concealer does the trick wonderfully well, because the same as the line pulls down at the outer corner of the mouth, so does it at the outer corner of the eyes. Mm -hmm. So put an upward slanted line of concealer there and at the inner corner of the eyes. Do you do that? Well, you don't use concealer, no. right? I, keep... <laughs> I don't use concealer, but I uh, sometimes I will have, um, I have had um, a darker foundation and a shade that I bought that was a wrong, um, the wrong shade. So it was too light. Yeah. So I've used that as a concealer Perfect. around the, my eyes and it has the, the smoothness and the consistency of foundation, but it has the effect of a, a concealer. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But I think my my main um, worry about 
doing all these things is that they're fine if you're doing it in order to take a snapshot to post on Instagram or a, a blog. But for a real life woman who's going yeah. about her real life life, yes, it's going to kick because you're going to smile, you're going to be mm -hmm. rubbing your eyes, you're going to be. So mm -hmm. I, I'm worried that around lunchtime, that frost, well, I, I agree with you, the frost shouldn't be anywhere near you anyway. But mm -hmm. the, you know, I, I'm worried that concealer will cake and mm -hmm become nasty looking mm -hmm. you know it wasn't my experience I uh, I am not shy with moisturizer around my eyes so maybe that makes a difference but uh, I didn't find that it was a problem it see I didn't use a whole lot of it and you know me well enough to know that I am not a fan of high maintenance makeup I am entirely the opposite mm -hmm. and I found that it was uh, it was quite okay but I could also see these days I don't use concealer I just don't take the time anymore and foundation is pretty good yep yeah. a good quality foundation is all you need indeed um okay let's go on to our next topic the next one that comes to my mind is translucent powder and I can say this real quickly which is put a whole lot of it on the upper eyelids so I, I use a little bit on my face. I'll talk about how I put it on the T-zone areas that are oily and have larger pores. I think we get into that. I'll bring that back a little bit later and talk about powder. But for right now, since we're around the eyes, um, pulling on the skin around my eyes does not, isn't something I enjoy at all. And neither does taking extra time to fix clumped up powder and colors that don't mix together. I don't put translucent powder under my eye, maybe at the inner bridge of the nose, but not under the eye because it's too dry and too cakey. But I put a whole lot on my upper eyelid along with primers. So we'll put links in the show notes of products that we like, but I use a Smashbox lid primer to prevent creasing. Possibly if I were a little less generous with moisturizer, I wouldn't have to, but I, I like <laughs> moisturizer better. And uh, on top of the primer, I will put a fair bit of translucent powder, same kind I put on my face. And that way, eyeshadow just blends around. There's no pulling and adjusting. You just, you put it on, you blend it a bit and it's fine. So I have a question. What, yeah. what kind of a brush do you use to apply that translucent powder on your I. <laughs> I use, I'm not one of the, I don't have a whole bunch of brushes. Uh, I just use the same sort of velour pad, I guess, that come came with the product. Uh, oh. Yeah. And I just oh. fold it in half and I push it right on there. So I don't rub across. I just push it right on, but right. a fair bit of it. And uh, then I put eyeliner on after and then I shadow and um, it's really well, I good. I ask because my translucent powder, um, I put it on with a brush, a, a mm -hmm. great makeup brush. And I was right. just envisioning using that on yes. uh, how, how I would do that. But the, the, a velour pad would work well. Yeah. I, can see that. I don't yeah. do brushes for powder because I can't uh, control it well enough. Mm -hmm. it, it's like it goes everywhere, you know. So with the velour pad, I tend to put it in the T-zone and then... Uh, fold it in half, push it into the lid area. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything that falls can be brushed away, but it, it usually doesn't actually, it's, it works really well. Did that velour pad come with your powder or is that an extra? It did. And <laughs> the, the, um, the label on the velour pad is a different brand than the powder. So obviously it didn't come with that powder, but ah, it, come it came with a powder. powder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's really just a velour pad. You probably could get them at, you know, dollar stores or anywhere. And um, yeah, I find it works really well. So the next tip, and that is mine. And that's, it's kind of a, non-tip because it's how I recently learned not to put on eyeliner which is quite an eye-opener for me <laughs> yeah. um, I you know I have very small eyes small squinty eyes so I have for years been trying to learn how to do the eyeliner on my wet uh, the wet line of my uh, eyes and I follow this woman on um, an eye doctor on Instagram um, I girl MD um, is her, um, well, we'll link, um, 
we'll link to it. Anyway, so she had this little, she has short videos about eyes and stuff and she's devastatingly beautiful. She's like so beautiful. Anyway, so she said that, listen, don't put eyeliner on the wet line. And she went on to say how there are some glands on the wet line of our eyes which uh, excrete some wax that we need to keep the eyes healthy and that you block that by using it and you can actually get very serious infections. Mm. So then I thought, well, then I don't have, sh I have the eye doctor's blessing that I should stop trying to experiment with putting eyeliner on my, uh, on, on the wet line. Mm. So now I'm, um, you know what I use for uh, eyeliner now these days, Christine? What? It's it's um, it's the Twelve Blueprints uh, eyeshadow. Nice. In, uh, not bright blue, but bright purple. Yeah. Oh, do you really? You I do. Imperfect. Yes, it's called oh, Imperfect, nice. and it is perfect. It's such a stupid yeah. name. You should have gotten another name for that. But anyway, <laughs> it is. It's fabulous, and I yeah. use just a very narrow brush, and I dab it onto the eye. I hope our, our listeners can envision how I'm doing these hand movements to show up. <laughs> anyway, I use a very uh, flat, small um, brush yeah. and I dab it into the eye uh, shadow and I kind of just stipple it into the lash line yes. from above, not yeah. on my wet line. Mm -hmm. And it looks really nice. And then nice. I follow up with mascara and away I go. It's nice. Very nice. I've seen that in a few seasons and it's a, it's a great way of wearing color and more effective than it's not as obvious as just a line by wet line. Do you mean the inner edge of the eyelids? Mm -hmm. So like the, the waterline kind of where there's no, just above the eyelashes on the bottom, just below the eyelashes on the top. It looks exactly. kind of fierce when you line. I think they call that tight lining. Ah, Maybe. I'm, yes. not, I'm not sure. Um, You're right. It's called tight lining. It is. Okay. So, yes, but it's it happens on, on the top, um, underneath your top lashes and yeah. above your um, bottom yeah. lashes. It's, it's um, a cool, fierce look, but I can see how it would seal certain channels that mm -hmm. are, would be beneficial to the eyes. No, never known anyone to have a problem with it, but I've also, I've, you know, you see it and you think, well, okay, but I don't know that it's the world's most, the only flattering way that woman could wear eyeliner. Let's put it True. that way. But for people with small squinty eyes, like I have, we try everything, you know? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I can talk about eyeliner. Trust me, my eyeliner challenge is, again, possibly because I'm <laughs> too exuberant with the moisturizer, but is trying <laughs> to keep um, lower eyelid liner in place. I do like liner along the lower eyelashes. I find that if you only put it on the top, the upper lid can look um, heavy or puffy, depending, I guess, on the color and the amount that you use. And I've tried every kind of pencil eyeliner and they all move. It doesn't matter how waterproof it says they are or how much I lay off the moisturizer. And I've tried primers and I've tried liquid eyeliners. The thing about liquid eyeliners that have um, a bottle that's kind of like a nail polish dispenser bottle or brush is there, I can't control it. The brush is too fat. The, the product is too thick. It's too dark. And it just doesn't work. And I um, have learned recently through the uh, Florentina's makeup master classes on chrysalis. And boy, did I learn a lot. And one had to do with eyeliner, which is for to use a small, thin line. And I, I wholeheartedly agree. It takes pounds off my face. However, how to do this. So also in the 12 Blueprints line is a product that is kind of magical, which is called Transformer. And what's magical about it is I've never found anything else that stays in place as well. It has it comes in probably a kind of a bottle like a nail polish brush, and it has let's say a cone shaped, fairly stiff little tiny sponge on the end, and from that comes out maybe like three hairs. It's it's incredibly fine, but it doesn't shake all over the place. So mm -hmm. you can use it with powder eyeshadows, whether they are 
a neutral color, whether they're purple, whatever it is they are. And once it's on and it dries, which takes a couple of seconds, nothing stays in place as well and can also intensify a powder eyeshadow. Um, so what I was doing, I, my daughter gave me a cover girl, um, those black liquid liners that many companies sell. And I would put some on my hand, the usual big black gob, cause that's how they come out. And then I would pick up a little bit with the transformer and that solved my problem really well. It was, it was excellent. Sometimes I would go put a little bit of powder on a cotton swab and go over it. But that was my 100% most controllable stay in place solution. But, you know, like you, I'm, I'm always looking for improvements on the eyeliner. And I noticed that L'Oreal, who, who they make that eye li the lip liner that I like. And when it says infallible, it's like Revlon's color stay. They really do mean that it's, it's not going to move a whole lot. And they make a pencil eyeliner called Super Slim. And I like pencils because it's what we're used to handling. Our fine motor skills are much better at dealing with pencils than they are at dealing with brushes with paint on, especially on my face, on our faces. So I did buy the gray because a lot of days I just want to define my features, but I'm not putting on eyeshadow. I'm not putting on mascara. I'm not going through the whole thing unless I'm filming. And uh, so I bought the gray and it's like a marker, super thin point, And you actually can easily get a series of kind of small strokes. If you rest your little finger on your cheekbone, you can paint on the line. The gray is dark enough and neutral enough that I would think many seasons would be able to use it. And it's awesome. Hmm. So that's my current makeup eyeliner thing. But you're saying it is a pencil. Yeah. But then you said it's like a marker. Is it like a pencil that you ah. can sharpen or is it like a marker that, that stays sharp? Gotcha. It's more like a very, very fine point marker that stays sharp. So it delivers the same sort of ink, I guess, that those nail polish type with a thicker brush. But this stuff is way more controllable. And I did buy the black in back to very thick, very heavy. And I think the tip on it, the delivery is a little bit heavier, but otherwise fine. And so, yeah. And, and please, listeners, if you have solved any of these problem. We would love to hear your solutions because there, there are lots of great ideas out there. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So that's my, my latest step forward with eyeliner. Super. So the next tip is mine. And that is thinking of foundation as an extended moisturizer and sunscreen. And again, this is not really a product hack, but it's more of a mindset hack, which I'm trying to spread the gospel, at least in Norwegian women's, where Norwegian women are concerned is use foundation. In my world, foundation was only, well, before, foundation was only used when I was going out to a big party or was going to do something extra. In recent years, I've been much more concerned with looking fresh and polished every day. So I'm training myself to not think of foundation as something extra special that I'm going to do. And maybe American women are different, but for, for us Scandinavian women, it's, it's kind of a new thing for me anyway, that I'm thinking of foundation as a Yes, like an extension of caring for my skin. Mm -hmm. uh, because we want to look young and fresh and rested. That's what makeup is all about, right? And what makes us look the most young and fresh? fresh <laughs> such a tricky language, English. Anyway, mm -hmm. what is it that's best at that? Yes, it's smooth skin. What makes your skin look young it's because it's smooth and using foundation makes your skin look smooth so why not just spread it on every day mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. thinking of it as makeup that that's kind mm -hmm. of my my hack yeah I, I entirely agree that this stuff is magical for evening out the skin tone and of all the makeup products it really is the least fussy once you have a color, but is yeah. it 
Is it so? I wondered when you were talking about Norwegian women if part of it was um, in here where I live. Now I'm in Eastern Canada, so this is not you know Manhattan, but BB creams and all these various names and words for tinted moisturizers and tinted sunscreens are, I think, pretty commonplace. And the other thing is they are very commonplace for young women. So it becomes a habit of sunscreen and color in the skin fairly early on. Is Norway, Norway is not that way, I take it. Probably the younger generation. But when I look at them, I think I see them wearing um, tinted moisturizers that make them look like they have a suntan it's 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 a very very um orangey brown kind of tinted orange uh, tinted not well it is tinted orange but Mm -hmm. moisturizer because i think they are trying to look like they've been in the sun Mm -hmm. which is not what i mean when i think about smoothing out your skin i i think it would look more natural if they if they didn't make it yes. look tanned but just smooth yeah but, I mean I, I was sorry I, no. I just was going to say I wonder if a lot of things about makeup have to do with mm, fear may be too strong a word but a concern over problems you're never actually going to have one though that I do acknowledge is getting the right color of foundation mm. that is a project and uh, it's a little bit, I think, like well, like the makeup at the 12 Blueprints shop, women will say, well, I don't wear makeup. And I said, I say to them, if someone were going to hand you a foundation, a blush, a gloss, and an eyeliner that would just go on your face and look like they absolutely belonged, then would you wear makeup? And they say, yeah, actually, I probably would. It's the work of finding it. Does yeah. that have any resonance with you? Yes, absolutely. I'm I'm um, I'm thinking that finding the right foundation color is like mm-hmm. finding that holy grail. It's like your lip liner, but even more important. And it's really worth mm-hmm. finding and holding on to once you find your mm-hmm. foundation that looks like skin, like mm-hmm. your skin, but better. It's true. It's, it's magic. It's magic. It's true. And honestly, although... I don't think any season has a much easier time of it. Bright winter can be challenging. I find it can be quite challenging to get a foundation for bright winter. But with every passing year, there are more and more of them. And women are sharing more knowledge and more information. And um, there are some that I find consistently work for women in a certain season. But everyone has to experiment. And I'd like to say that no one's ever going to buy a product that they don't use but you might, it, because like all learning, you, you don't go from zero to 100, you go to 10 and then to 20. So every choice you're improving, but it takes a little bit of practice. The, the reward, the thing that keeps you going, the incentive is that you look really a lot better and you feel better as you move into your later years. Mm-hmm. I think so. You feel the way you look in your mirror and even if you're just staying at home vacuuming to just have that pleasant yeah. feeling that you look fresh and rested. But I think we should be a little forgiving about to uh, forgiving of ourselves. You know, you won't find that perfect foundation right away. You have to mm-hmm. kiss some frogs before you find mm-hmm. the print, you know? Yep. Yeah. It's a very true fact. And uh, for women who, who do know their season, look online because these questions have been answered for you. And it's very likely in the online groups that within two or three products, you'd find something very good. And um, when you talk about thinking of foundation as extended moisture, I mix the two together. So in the summer, I use a Paula's Choice more mattifying. In the winter, I use a more moisturizing sunscreen mix a fairly opaque foundation, mix the two on my hand, put it on like it's, I mean, nothing, you know, just like any kind of cream and uh, blend it a little bit and that's it. We're done. Yep. So it's, it really is a very easy thing, but you just got to find that color. Yep. And it's yeah. worth spending energy and a little bit of money on. It is finding it. And, and if it doesn't fit, then toss it and don't feel yeah. bad about it. I agree. And, and, you know, when you're mixing it with moisturizer or sunscreen, the color has to be even less perfect because it's Mm -hmm. being diluted. And 
unless your skin is really kind of glorious, it's other makeup. It's a little harder to wear other makeup without that, the canvas, you know, without foundation in place, at least a little bit, just to even out the colors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, foundation is definitely worthwhile, worth taking the time or find her a friend who knows her way around foundation, someone who can go to those counters with you and talk to the salespeople and look at a few things on your face and say, uh-uh, don't, don't, there's just no way that's going to be, who knows what you want. If you want to look warm and tanned all the time, okay, you know, and if you just want to look like your face is evenly colored about the color of your neck, well, okay, that's possible too. It's just not that hard to do. But it, it is, I agree with you, it's very, very worthwhile. Oh, and I want to remind our listeners that about your uh, series of blog posts on uh, Chrysalis, you, where you have the right polish for the mm. different seasons. That's mm -hmm. also very useful mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. when you're on the hunt, because to know that what finish you're looking for is good. It helps a lot to not to be recognizable to yourself, especially when you're starting out with something and to not get talked into things because, no. you know, as color analysts, we are really very discriminating about saying certain things don't work because we know a better alternative that will work. So mm -hmm. it's never, this doesn't look good on you. So you have to give up. It's not that at all. It's just, instead of this, try that. Okay, next one has to do with highlighter powders. And I, uh, I've, I gave up on highlighter powders because maybe because there's some autumn in my coloring, I find that anything too shiny looks oily and wet and anything too glittery looks too disco for a 60 year old woman who you know, lives a lot of time in fleece. <laughs> so I had given up on them. Uh, I stopped using them. However, I did have the Align service with Florentina, and you can read about that on Chrysalis Color under the Makeup Master classes and also under the uh, Color Analysts. You'll see Florentina Mossu in the Netherlands. And I was such a believer in the Align style analysis system for design, for the types of designs that one would wear in clothing and in haircuts and accessories. So when Florentina wrote about the master classes and she talked about my type, she mentioned uh, the use of highlighters. And for all the, the different body types, she doesn't write off anything as you can't use this. It has more to do with, instead of using it that way, use it this way. This is what on your body type, you're trying to get this product to do. On another person, they're trying to get it to do something else. And so they'll use it differently. So interested in trying anything, I wanted to buy a highlighter to try it, but the powders on, I have a small face, they go everywhere. I look like, I, I look like I'm ready for a, a costume ball. Even mm -hmm. if I put, you know, just a little bit of it on and particularly with a brush, it goes everywhere. So I found a product by Maybelline. It comes in a little pod and it's called Master Chrome Gel. And I know th I knew that gel eyeliners were good because once that product dries down, it doesn't move anymore. So I bought this gel and I liked it. I bought color number 20, which is a pale pink gold. The first time I put it on with my fingertip, just on the top of my cheekbone, we were back to <laughs> like I'd been <laughs> dipped in grease or something. It, it just goes everywhere. But you practice a few times, you'll figure it out. I now put it on with a Q-tip. So I put a little dot of it on the top of my cheekbone and maybe a little bit of it just at the brow bone underneath the outer corners of the eyebrows. Plenty, plenty. But it really does a lovely job of sculpting your face a little bit. Do you use highlighters? Because you've got a little spring in your coloring, so it would be a better look for you or mm. easier. Well, I, yes, well, I am... Um... For the way you talk about using it, a little bit on top of my cheekbones, I have a Scandinavian brand called Tromborg, which has, a, um, it's like, it, they call it, what is this beautiful name, illuminating powder. Mm -hmm. And she has it in sun and moon, and I use the moon. And it's, it's kind of shimmery without being glittery. So nice. if... If I do something like that, just on the top of my um, cheekbones, I use that. Mm -hmm. It's 
it's a loose powder. Mm -hmm. So uh, careful application is mm -hmm. the key. Um, yes, mm -hmm. and um, so yes, it does. It does really make something do something for your eyes, doesn't it? Yes, it really does. And as you say, the powder has to be very finely milled because I've looked at eyeshadow highlighters, but boy, the sh you got to control the stuff because it's, it's just, it's artificial looking. It doesn't create, it doesn't enhance um, a point or an angle or a curve. It's just a, a, a shiny stripe. Well, one eyeshadow that I really like and have used um, is an, um, it's a cream, cream eyeshadow which is water-based and it comes in a with the, like a little um, sponge wand and I've used it I put a little um, uh, drop of it on my middle eyelid mm -hmm. and that kind of makes my made my eyes pop mm -hmm. yeah and that is in kind of a it's called um, it's the brand is Inglot and the uh, eyeshadow is called aquastic it's it's water soluble it's very nice easy to remove but it mm -hmm. really stays where you want it yeah. oh and so it's I, a nice shadow it, I, okay i didn't nice shadow it. yes nice shadow interesting yeah. it's it's not a highlighter liquid highlighter it's an eyeshadow right. and i've um yeah i like that and it has it is like a pinky very nice champagne it's very nice Another thing that I like that I came upon um, in my love of moisturizers and it, with this was back when they first came out and it was supposed to be like a glowing moisturizer. Well, it was glowing though, right? <laughs> it was, so this is a product by First Aid Beauty called Coconut Smoothie and it's kind of lovely. It's just this cream in a tube, really quite lovely. But the glow for me is just too much. It, it looks wet and oily and fake. What I did like about it, though, is the, gl the glowy component is the most finely milled that I have ever seen, more so than any highlighter or eyeshadow I've ever seen, because it's intended, I guess, as a moisturizer to make your whole face glow, or maybe that's what glassy skin is. I've been reading about glassy skin, but I've, I haven't gone into, I haven't looked at it yet. Um, wait, 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 is that a moisturizer or is it a highlighter? So it is, this stuff I think is a moisturizer. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's supposed to be kind of a glowing, um, a moisturizer that leaves a glow. Mm -hmm. For my whole face, it's way too much. But what I like about it is that it does give a very believable, just kind of glowy skin effect. And rather than using it on the whole face, I'll put it on kind of the curve at the top of my cheekbone mm -hmm. and I will put it under the brow bone. I'll put it on the tip of my nose, um, just trying to, so we know that light colors move forward and dark colors recede, trying to pull the, front, the middle of the face forward and bring light to the middle of the face and let there be contour and shadow around the outside. And a lot of times I will use that with foundation and not really any other makeup, maybe a bit of eyeliner. And it just mm -hmm. defines the curves and the angles of the face in a, it plays with light more than it plays with color. And I really like it. I think it's terrific. And I also will put it at the inner and outer corner of my eyes to give a, a concealer or highlighter effect without, it, it really is just a moisturizer. And so I don't worry about it moving around too much because it's not shiny enough to matter. And it's not, you know, it's not going to do any harm if it does move around. It sounds like perfect for, for doing a no makeup, makeup look. It's just super. A yeah. yeah, very low key. You don't have to be careful about where you put it exactly. And um, right. yeah. but it sounds like you're kind of bringing out the architecture of your face with it, mm -hmm. with the top of your nose and the way mm -hmm. you uh, sound. It sounds like you. Ooh, I'm I do. I do. I really rediscovered contour and highlighter since um, Florentina's because I don't mind doing it as long as I, you know, like the effect and it doesn't take a whole lot of time. And so I've just rediscovered contouring as well. And I just use a kind of cool tone bronzer. I'm not super fussy about it. And uh, I will put it under the blush way back by the kind of in front of my ears at the hairline or maybe just below the cheekbones. Mm -hmm. And I'll put it a little bit on the sides of my nose. The other place I put it is along my jawline and the front of my neck, mostly when I'm filming to try to pull my face 
forward off my neck and give a three-dimensional effect. And that's, that's another one that I have found is when you contour your jawline, which I think a lot of women do to give themselves a jawline as those lines get softer later in life, is tuck your chin in a little bit. If you go along the jawline, the risk is that people looking at you from the side or as your head moves are going to see a line. And so if you tuck your chin in a little bit and use a very big brush along the jawline and pull it down the neck a little bit, nobody's going to see the line. And it helps to move your neck back and your face forward in the same way that a lot of models and people being photographed when they're looking straight at the camera are told to push their, pull their face forward a little bit on their neck. You can't see that from the front and it really helps to slenderize the facial contour and so on. So this is a makeup way of doing it. So the next tip is mine again, and that is using lipstick as a blush. And this is because I'm all for simplifying. And if I can get by with using five products with instead of using six products, I will do it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I put on my lipstick and then I dab, I take the lipstick brush or my finger and I dab a little bit of lipstick on the highest point of my um, cheekbones and I, I go stipple, 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 stipple and I'm done. And it's the perfect shade because my lipstick is the perfect shade for mm. me. So then mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about the blush matching my lipstick and it's so easy. Mm. And because I use a cream foundation, a cream blush in the shape of lipstick is mm -hmm. perfect. I, for many women, it is. I tried that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and I found that it moved around a lot. It, it, do you? Maybe you have drier lipstick you were using or drier skin texture. But in time, when I tried that, I, when I got uh, the color intensity, I felt like it was starting to migrate over a bigger area. You, you have any experience with that? Or do you find that it just stays where you put it? I don't know. I think... I think I've never stayed. Yeah, stays where you put it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm like it's just redistributing the rosiness, but I'm I have a very rosy face naturally. So mm. if I've been walking, I'm the rosiness of my face is just kind of pushing through my foundation. Mm. Um, but I no, I haven't thought about it. But I um, I use very little, and, mm -hmm. and so I don't use. No, didn't think yeah. about it just enough to kind of define it, it really is so much about defining the features as opposed to colorizing the features right, it, right. it's really give yourself eyes give yourself a nose and give yourself a mouth and it's really hard to have one without the other I know you shared with me recently about a client and this is uh something I think happens in so many people until you have a mouth it's it's somehow your eyes don't appear put a mouth on your face and poof, all of a sudden, everybody can see your eyes. Mm -hmm. So something about feature definition, uh, it, it doesn't have to look like makeup, it just gives you more presence, I think. Would you agree or, or no? Yes, I do. I do. And I think it, the goal for me is that it shouldn't look like makeup. It yes. should look like I'm well rested and that my lips have blood in them and, and yes. that people get on eye contact with me. Yeah. And um, I think every season has uh, like a, an abundance of perfect lipsticks that bring out their eyes. Oh, and, they do. And I think, um, yeah, in, in any form, whether, you know, I think when we talk about lipstick listeners or people a little less familiar with our work think, well, you, you got to go around with red lips, not at all. You, you can go around with uh, a very sheer lip nobody's really going to know you have anything on but lip balm if mm. you if you choose the color and the formulation okay next one bouncing around a little bit with our topics here but an, another one came to my mind because this is a challenge for me is in the t-zone and particularly in my nose i my pores can be quite large and um so when i put on foundation i've mixed it with sunscreen as i do all year round and instead of putting the foundation, just smoothing it on the T-zone, I take the brush at 90 degrees to my nose and I kind of push the product. I stipple it right into the pores and then one quick brush over the top upwards. And that 
that makes a big difference. The foundation I use right now is Rimmel's 24 hour. Really, this is a color game. Once I find the color, uh, I will find a way to make it work because it can be quite challenging. So I, it's a quite an opaque foundation and mix it with the sunscreen. I drive it right into the pores using the brush sideways, quick flick upwards with the brush just to smooth it out, a couple of minutes to dry. And then I do with the translucent powder, I put a fair bit of it in the T-zone. And again, what you don't want to do is rub it across the pores. So I press it in into the pores kind of in an in and out or tapping motion, but uh, do not rub it don't rub it across the pores. And so that's terrific. It makes the pores disappear and you have good foundation, good, uh, yeah, good smooth looking, even poreless skin. Wow. Yep. I'm riveted. Yeah, My that's a good one. Yeah. And back when I was talking about, sorry, Yoren, I think I might have cut you off. No, 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 no. Um, Go ahead. When I was talking about concealer, I, I don't put it, I think it's overdone around eyes. You, you can see it, the texture isn't good for the skin around the eyes. There are some fantastic concealers these days, but it, it's a challenging product. Where I think it's underdone is around the nose because at the base of the nostrils where the nose sits on the face, a lot of people see our nose because there are these two dark brackets around the nose. It's where we have redness, it's where we have pores, it's where we have broken veins. We all do everybody some more than others, but. Um, I got plenty, trust me. And so that's a great place for either a heavier layer of um, or undiluted foundation or to go ahead and use a concealer, put it around the base of the nostrils and almost up into the nostrils because there can be broken veins there. You want a lot of illumination in the upper lip. And uh, I do that when I'm filming. I keep, I make sure there are no shadows around my nose and in the upper lip. I'll even put some of the highlighters we talked about in the bow of the upper lip. You want that area lit up. So again, you put your concealer on either before or after foundation. I'm not a person who thinks it matters very much, but everyone has a preference. And then put powder on. Um, really, really makes a difference in smoothing out the appearance of the face. And it sounds complicated, but honestly, it's not. If it were, neither I nor Yoren would be doing any of this stuff. <laughs> no, I, I really think that was a very, very good point you're making because the area around the, the nostrils and the nose, I, like I, everybody knows by now, I don't use concealer, but I'm particularly careful about applying the foundation very, very, very thoroughly there and on my... What's that called? The area just to the, the left and right of your nose? <laughs> yeah, the well, the, the middle cheek kind of, yeah, just right, sort of exactly. just below the apple of the cheek. Right, because I have broken capillaries there because I've been outside so much. And then mm. to smooth out that with a mm -hmm. very, being very, very careful. But I'm, I'm very curious about using the foundation brush and stippling it in. That's something completely yeah. new. What I do think. What kind of a shape foundation brush is that? That is it. Yeah, so they they come in sort of conical shapes with a flat top, which might or might not be called a stipple brush. This is a paddle shape, oh. and I just do this between my eyebrows, um, on the center of the chin, and on my nose. Everywhere else, I just smooth it across the yeah. pores. I don't really worry about it. But and the other thing about you don't want shadows around the base of the nostrils is because as we get older, we get more of a crease from the base of the nostril down to the mouth. Yep. And if there's a lot of shadowing already around the base of the nostrils, it will make that crease, it'll be kind of continuous with the crease and they reinforce one another. So, mm -hmm. you know, control what you can control. <laughs> and around the nose, it's not so bad with concealer because there are bones there to keep the skin tight and firm and in place. You don't have to worry about pulling at the skin too much and you can get pretty opaque and just go quickly mix it with the foundation and it's pretty forgiving color wise as well under the eyes eyes are a focal point the skin is delicate and I really go easy with concealer around eyes yes another one of my tips and we're back on lips again I think a lipstick brush is the best investment you can make and it's because it's economical and because you can do very precise, well, obviously you get a much more precise application of lipstick when you use a lipstick brush, especially when you want to avoid the resting bitch face that we talked about 
<laughs> at the beginning of the episode. Uh, but it's like I find a favorite lipstick. And when it's all used up, we think it's all flat on the top. When you start digging out using a lipstick brush, I swear there's as much lipstick in mm -hmm. the bottom of the tube as it is in the top that's visible when you buy it. 20 so more you, applications. You, you double the lifetime of your favorite lipstick. Yep, Just I by agree. digging it out with a lipstick brush. You mm -hmm. can't, can't have it in your handbag and do it, but I think God, yes. that's such a, such a, an important trick to It was know. a good one. Back when I was working more publicly, I used to take a lipstick brush because I often mix lipsticks and I would have two or three of them and I would load them with the color in the morning and then put them in a pouch in my purse and they disappear more easily into pockets and wallets and other things than a bullet of, you know, the lipstick tube. And then you could reapply as much or as little as you wanted during the day. Do you wear lip liner, Yorin? I don't. Well, I haven't, I've, I've tried, but I haven't found the perfect color because they all look so brown. Dark. So if brown, I found yes. the perfect color, I would buy 30 of them too, but I, <laughs> I haven't. Yep, but, they do, they're heavy too. There's something happened with lipstick, I think some time ago when it became more pigmented than any living human being or most of us anyway. And uh, the same happened to lip liner. It just would never fade into something that wouldn't be too attention getting. Mm -hmm. Have you ever found one you kind of liked or? No, I haven't, but I, you know, it's like, I haven't looked very hard, but sure. I should. If you have a tip, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, well, and they're hard because they're hard to test. And in the world forward, I'm sure there's one out there, but most brands, you can't take the top off and test it. And well, so you do end up spending more than you really want to spend on a product you might not need. Yes, uh, I, I did see that MAC has a couple of tempting colors that look tempting on an online store. So I may invest in one. Interesting, yeah. And try it. Yeah, because it would it would, like I said, help with the resting bitch face. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a good. I like it. I find it's a very good product. Mm. I'm jealous that you found yours. <laughs> yeah, I bought a few. Trust me, I bought a few. And you really, for me, you know, you have to go much paler than you think. The other issue is they're all too warm, just like most makeup. It, it's all too warm. And so it, it looks a little bit more muddy than healthy. And I've ne never been a real fan of brown lips, you know, um, or a product that looks like brown lips. Mm -hmm. So Autumn may have lipsticks that are brownish, but when they wear them, it does not look like mud. It looks like beautiful, healthy, luscious lips. Next topic. This is one of my absolute favorite things is to have a brow wax, a transparent brow wax separate from whatever color you're putting in the eyebrows. And I like powders. I've tried pencils, but the lines that they make are, they're too linear. And the pencil, even if the color is right, I still have, they don't have a good enough holding power. When I've used a brow and a pigment mixed together in one product, it would dry pretty quickly in the container and the texture was never as good within even a month and you've still got three quarters of it left. So when I have the product separately, I can control the color of the powder and I can control the longevity or the duration and the powders come in all sorts of colors. So you can formulate, I find when I'm filming that whatever product I use will look lighter and warmer, whether it's yellower or redder, depends on other factors. So when I'm filming, I'll use a fairly dark brown, still working on the, the favorite one, but whatever color you use, you still want the brows to be groomed and for the hairs to lie flat. And so the wax is something you can put on through the day. And this particular product stays on, you know, I think of it as nobody moves till I say so. <laughs> so is that, is that the 12 blueprints? Yeah, about? it is. It is. It just comes in a little pan and I scrape it off with sort of the baby fingernail, just a tiny bit, mix it between my fingers to warm it up. And then when I apply it, as I do with colors for eyebrows, I'm putting it in an upwards moving direction. 
And um, I know that some women actually will recommend to exfoliating the brow area or somehow scrubbing it a bit because there can be dead skin or loose skin and brow products don't apply as smoothly. At 60 years old, I do not want I, um, eyebrows that they're thin enough, you know, and also as they get grayer, they get less and less visible. So I don't really want to have less hair. I just want to be able to control the color and the direction of what I do have. And yeah, so the powder goes on brushing upwards, the wax then goes on brushing upwards, very quick with a brush, those twisty things, my daughter tells me they're called spoolies, <laughs> those twisty little brushes just to straighten out the hairs along the top edge. And that's it. And it just works great. Hair stays flat, shape stays in place, and it lasts the day. Mm, does it? And so you put the, the I, I know these, um, uh, I have these uh, 12 blueprints. So there's a pan of color powder and then there's a pan of wax and you yep. apply the powder first to color yep. and then you you warm up and apply the yep. wax to seal it. Is that the idea? Kind of like that. I have a stiff, a small, stiff angled brush I use for the powder, for the color, brush it upwards. Everything goes upwards. And then I'll scrape a little bit on my baby fingernail between my index fingers, brush that upwards, wait a minute, and then just slick, slick over the top edge. And um, yeah, I mean, you can do it with any color you want, but I find that that's that thing about separate wax lasts forever. And I'll go through three pans of wax, four pans of wax, maybe for each pan of powder, but it just snaps into the pellet. It's not, not super expensive oh, and it's great. You can, you can buy replacement wax. Oh yeah. Oh. I, I'll do, I'll go through four waxes for a pan of powder. And then the, I use each of them to the very end and I can use more wax because it's clear and mm -hmm. it's stiff enough. It's maybe stiffer than hair gel. I suppose you could use hair gel too, if you wanted, but it just works really, really well. Hmm. Yeah. Something strange that I read about lately was that the latest thing is to use a brow soap. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea how that works. I had to Google it. Yeah. It's a thing, brow soap. My main concern with that is if, you know, it's probably lovely, but I, I spend so much time outdoors. Mm -hmm. I'm, thinking I'm walking the dog. It's raining. Mm -hmm. Will the soap start running into my eyes? That sounds very uncomfortable. But so if yeah. any of our listeners have experience with brow soap, please yeah, tell yeah, us yeah. how it works. Indeed. But anyway, until then, I, my, my, I'm putting my money on brow wax. I think the, yeah. it's worth my eyebrows are anyway. bushy. Yes, my eyebrows are so bushy. I need something to tame them. Mm. Like you said, nobody moves till I tell Nobody them moves till I say so, yeah. yeah. I, um, and, you know, you see all sorts of brow trends. I mean, microblading and little brushes and things. But like the rest of my face, I don't want it to look like I worked at it. So it's fine if the rest of you, you know, if, if you have an obviously made up look that you enjoy and you, people can tell you've done something with your lips and you're wearing various face products, well, that's great. But that's not the face that I want. I really just want to look like me without everybody knowing when then she did this to her brows and that to her eyes. So yeah, yeah I like a much more natural effect. So this is the one that works, works for me that I keep coming back to. So before we end this episode, we want to draw attention to a question that we got, or Christine got a lovely email from a listener and she asked, or she said that she would love to hear about how one's seasoning, seasonal, what, God, this language, Christine. <laughs> Let me start again. I would love to hear about how one's seasonal coloring can enhance home decor. Decor? Decor, decor. I mean, we'd have to, th we'll have to think about that. It's a super question. And mm -hmm. would I be right, Joran, in saying that our focus is generally um, in our own personal appearance? I know in my home, I because I work with color all day, maybe the walls are very neutral. There's hardly anything even hanging on my walls. Do you mm. use your season in your home? No, but no, I don't because I don't know. I, I think, I think of 
my season's coloring as something that I wear as clothes or makeup. And I certainly would think of it if I'm doing a Zoom call where the background is going to be part of how people see my face. Like mm -hmm. I would never use one of those Zoom backgrounds with the brick wall, the, the rusty mm -hmm. red brick wall. It's because huge. I'm mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's very important. But I think for, for home decoration, interior decoration, I would see a problem because unless you were a family of all true winters or, or mm -hmm. all springs, how would you decide which color gets the room, which season gets the yeah, room? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's my main yeah. concern. And it's, it's not like, it, since I'm a bright winter, I need to look at bright winter colors all the time. I'm much more with you that I'm, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree with you. I think mm. it's more about how I present myself to the world, mm -hmm. not what about not about the colors I surround yeah. myself with. I, one thing, though, that your your country and mine also have in common is that daylight is not a guarantee <laughs> <laughs> by any means. So daylight and room. Uh, Joran is in Norway, and I'm in Canada. So. Daylight and also room paint are hard to control. And I know when I'm in people's homes, you somehow can get into bathrooms that are either it's impossible to see yourself because the walls are lime or because the walls are dark or the lighting is or the room paint. It, it's almost too flattering. I mean, you're better off have, starting off unflattering and then it's uphill from there. But you can get into bathrooms that are just so beautifully, glowingly candle lit coral <laughs> you look an awful lot better than you actually do and you also look warmer than you actually look so you, it's hard to gauge what you're putting on and because I do so much filming and I have these obsessions with lighting be, just from color analysis I have found that you can get what are called clamp lights and um, these they have hundreds of these at Amazon they have them at Home Depot they have them all over the place wherever you live um, where you can clamp the light onto whatever's around. And there are particular bulbs, they're LED bulbs. They have a hundred watt brightness and these buggers are bright. So you may want to move them back, but that's even better because then they have a nice diffused light or put something over the front of the light, white mesh fabric or something. And it's a cool, but soft kind of diffused light. And that in a neutral colored bathroom if possible, but in any neutral colored corner, um, I think would be really useful and appropriate for today's show because whatever color you aim at something, that's the color that's coming out again. And so it matters tremendously when we apply makeup. Where do you put your makeup on, Yaren? Uh, daylight my, or? No, daylight. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, I was being polite. Like, what, 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 what daylight? What daylight? <laughs> No, no, no. We had, we recently redid the, our bathroom lighting, and I requested a. It's a. It's an LED um, strip, uh, like a stick or so. Or how do you say it in English? Strip. A strip. Strip. Yeah. Yes, it's a strip, and it is way bright. It's it's yes. like, it's the kind of lighting that's more like for used in laboratories for killing rats. It's not yes. for ambiance. Mm -hmm. And it, it's super, super bright. And then mm -hmm. my philosophy is like you, it's like, if I put on my makeup and it looks okay in that light, it's for yeah. sure it will look like, okay. It'll look reasonable. If I move into daylight or if I move into a candlelit yes. uh, room. And in our age, we, we look better the less light there is. So. <laughs> but, well, maybe. But, Sometimes I think I look better with like darkness but anyhow sorry I'm, I'm, yeah 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 that's what I mean it's the less the, the less light there is the better we look so candle light is better but yeah. not for putting on makeup we need like flood light we need that. a lot of light but do you find when spring rolls around that you think oh I, I, I look better than I thought I did <laughs> <laughs> suddenly there's more light and you look at yourself and think oh, okay things aren't as bad as I thought but and I don't know if listeners know this but this does matter to me as well when you buy a light source, there are so many these days and you'll see things marketed as full spectrum. But to me, the light is weirdly yellowish 
coral. It, it, it's not particularly attractive, but if you find a temperature over 5,500 Kelvin, mm -hmm. uh, capital K is how you'll always often see it, and a CRI at least over 90, there's a company, I think they're from Beijing, but they have subsidiaries in different places called UG International. And they've got every kind of strips and cones and many different shapes of lamps. And I imagine like with your strip lights, Joran, um, could you mount them anywhere? Do they, do they plug in, are they on a fixture in the ceiling or could you put them across the top of a mirror? How do they connect to the power in the house? Yes, they are, they are connected to the power with a cord, so it's not... Um, are they on... Did you have to buy a mount, or did they come with a mount, and you just had to put uh, it on the wall and plug it in, like... Well, my husband did it, so ask him. Right. No, anyway, he... <laughs> we'll have him on the podcast. <laughs> yes, it's a shelf. It's a shelf, and it's it's mounted on the under the shelf yeah. and above directly above my face yes yeah and i specifically i think i requested yeah it's 55k the kelvin is is actually a very good thing to mm -hmm. get acquainted with and to mm -hmm. request yeah i agree know this the electrician is going to try to persuade you to get the candlelight because this yeah. is not this is too bright it's not going to yes. be cozy yes and i have to work really hard to tell them that i don't want cozy no I want not in that application. Light. Yeah, in my living room, maybe. I'm okay. not saying I want to sit in the evening and read by that light, but it, there, it's just so available these days. And yeah, it makes a huge difference. Another big improvement in LED lighting has been that in the beginning, and this was true back when I used to do fluorescent lighting too, that it would overdevelop the greens and the yellows. Well, but it was fine. It was good enough. It was, we use, we do so much more in, in a color analysis than just look at exact colors. But when they got better and better at developing the reds, it was amazing how authentic, how much more pigment the light could pull out of whatever it was, um, your fabric, your swatches, or your face, and how much more authentic the lighting was. So it was really very valuable to, to make that step forward. But in my bathroom, I, I don't use too fancy of a light. I just use a, a hundred watt LED bulb with a cool, soft light. And it is absolutely fine and controllable. And it's the same all the time. So you're not trying to put makeup on in the dark and you're not getting weird mustard reflections. It's a pretty steady light. And because it's on a clamp, you can put it anywhere in your house. You don't have to have a particular mirror situation. Yep. Yeah. Good tip. Yeah. Well, Christine, shall we call that our episode for today? I think, uh, well, I had fun with all these me tips. Me too. Yeah, Just me to too. Me. I had a great time. We yes. will find links to all the things we talked about for yeah. our listeners. And please, when when we ask you for your tips and the solutions you're, you have found, we, we do mean it quite sincerely. <laughs> we want to know how you've solved your various problems because everybody um, benefits Yes. And also keep questions coming because yes. that really fuels our uh, fantasies well, of how, what we're going to do next in our episodes. So, yes. so we, we take these tips and questions very seriously and appreciate them so much. So yeah, keep asking and keep tipping. It's true. I, and I, I, um, to reiterate, reiterate what Yaren says, thank you to the reader who, who sent the suggestion. And, you know, sometimes we process things for a little longer, but people will ask me, why do you write a lot about winter? Because they ask, because they email me with lists of questions and situations. And so, so really believe us, it, it's not in any way um, intrusive. It's entirely welcome for us to see the world how you see it and help you solve the problems that you're having as we all move forward together. Yep. So we'll, we'll we won't see them, but we'll you will hear from us in another yes. month. In another month. And in the meantime, thank you so much for, for listening and for being here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.